Hello and welcome to today's video. My name is Anakin. I design knitting patterns. I teach knitting workshops online and in person and I sell yarn which you can find at yarnaddict.co.uk today. Yarnaddict.co.uk even. Um, today I'm going to do a knit and chat. I'm working on a cow. It's brioche cow. I want to knit a one version where I flip the colour halfway through the round. So now I'm doing a version where I don't flip the colour and I've just dropped a couple of stitches off my needles. So I've Push them back on again. So I'm going to try and knit on this while I chat to you today and I'm going to chat about what it's like being a knitwear designer. Maybe spill a few secrets, bust a few myths, just a few things that I fancy chatting about. So I hope you enjoy this. I was talking about some of these things in a workshop recently and somebody said that they found it interesting um, to hear some of these things that I was saying. So I thought maybe I'll do a video about it. So I'm going to try and knit while I'm chatting to you. I'm actually on a pattern row, so I've just got to check what I'm doing. Am I on a pattern row? No, I'm not on a pattern row. Okay, so if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. It's completely free for you, but it really helps me to build my channel. And um, if you have a comment, let me know. Um, so I started designing, well, I had my first pattern published. I think it was in about 2017, maybe, no, not 2017, 2007. Um, 2007, that sounds a bit better. I discovered this um, online magazine. It was based in the UK. I'm not going to say the name of it um, for a reason that will become clearer maybe a little bit later on. But I um, had my pattern published. I submitted a pattern. It was a sock pattern. I never actually got paid for it but I didn't really care because I just wanted to say I had a pattern published. Um, it was a sock pattern, quite simple lacy sock pattern and then a few months later I um, approached the same publication with a couple of shawl designs and the lady who ran them, this online magazine said that she was starting a print magazine it was going to kind of be a, like an independent print magazine because all the other knitting magazines were owned by um, bigger publishing companies. So that sounded quite exciting and she said could she publish those short patterns in that magazine so I said yes and I did get paid for those. Uh, this is going to become important a bit later on and then around the same time so we're talking now before really social media there were blogs because I was already blogging but there wasn't Twitter, Instagram, that kind of thing and um, it was before Ravelry, so it was difficult to kind of get in contact with other designers and make friends with other designers and chat to other designers and share experiences and that kind of thing. And But somebody I knew locally introduced me to a local designer who was already being published in quite a few of the knitting magazines that were around at the time. Just got to click my row counter. And so she put me in touch with... Um, some of the other editors including Let's Knit and then I contacted them and I started getting patterns published there and around the same time I started teaching and it just got the ball rolling and once I'd been published in a few magazines it kind of gave me the confidence to approach other magazines and I have um, since then been published in most of the British knitting magazines. Um, I've been published in a German magazine once or twice that was through a young company um, and I've been published in several American magazines, Vogue Knitting and some of the other magazines that were published by the same publisher as Vogue Knitting. And I've also done quite a few designs for books published by the same publisher as Vogue Knitting. Um, Vogue Knitting is called Designer Knitting in the UK. And I, um, what else? I was published in Interweave Knits and some of the other magazines that Interweave used to publish. I've been published in the Debbie Bliss magazine, which is an American magazine, even though she's British. The magazine was primarily made for the American market, I think. Um, I've designed for several yarn companies and yeah, I've done quite a lot of designing over the years. Um, I also self-publish, so I kind of know the industry from quite a few different angles, really. There are a lot of designers who just self-publish, who decide that being published by magazines is not for them and I quite understand that there are very valid reasons for that some of those I will touch on in a minute I think one of the main reasons why people choose not to get published in magazines is um, pay the big American magazines like Vogue Knitting and Interweave Knits 
I'm not sure if the interweave nets are still around actually. I'm not, I think they are, but I'm not 100% sure. Let me know if you know. Um, they've kind of fallen off my radar for some reason. But vogue knitting is still around. Um, although they are doing fewer issues um, at the moment. The last design I did for them, which wasn't actually for vogue knitting, it was one, for one of their other publications, I think. They do loads of public. They do loads of other publications for young companies. They do young collection pattern collections for young companies. They do books, loads of different stuff. So it was the same publisher, and the last thing I did for them, I actually sent off, and it arrived in New York, like the day after New York went into the first COVID lockdown. I realized what was happening. And I got it finished quickly and shipped off with I don't know, FedEx or something, I think. And hoping it would get there in case they went into lockdown. And it didn't. And it took me a week or two to actually get in touch with somebody and get an alternative address and get it redirected and eventually delivered. And I was quite nervous because obviously if they didn't receive it, there wasn't a guarantee I was going to get paid. But I did get it eventually and it did eventually get published. Um, but that was the last time I did anything for um, any overseas magazine or publication or publisher, really. But I've had quite a few things published by them over the years. And I think the main reason why a lot of designers choose not to be published in magazines is because of the low pay. The American magazines, the big ones, Vogue Knitting and that, they pay reasonably well for their for Vogue Knitting, but their other publications pay considerably less. I don't know about the American monthly magazines. I haven't been published by them, so I don't know what they're like. But the British magazines, which are mostly monthly, the pay is relatively low. There are a couple that pay slightly more. Um, the other problem is that they only pay once, most of them, not all of them, but most of them only pay once a magazine's been published. So I could do a design, say this month, and send it in. And, you know, I've done all the pattern writing, I've either knitted it or my sample knitter has knitted it and they want to get paid and I won't get paid by the magazine till the design's been published. And that might not be till next spring. So say something that's going to go in the May issue um, and it's usually um, paid about a month after the, the issue comes out. So it's quite a long time to wait, really. There are a couple of magazines that pay quicker. And they also pay more, but um, that seems to be the general rule of thumb. I remember having this discussion or this conversation with a, um, I don't think I should name her, but a very well British designer who has her own yarn as well. And oh, hang on, I was uh, saving a video and it's just finished saving, so I'm just gonna do that quickly. Um, I was saving a video, I've just edited a video, so it was just saving uh, while I was sitting here chatting. And um, she was saying that she was really surprised when I told her about the situation in working for a magazine. She was really, really surprised. She said, what are you supposed to live on in the meantime? And that is a good point. And when you start out, you can't expect to get paid straight away. But the same thing kind of goes for self-published patterns. When you self-publish patterns, you have to, people have to know about you. If people don't know you exist, they're not going to buy your patterns. And there are so many designers now. Ravelry has made it very easy for people to publish their own patterns, which is great because when I started out, I was really struggling with working out where I could actually sell my patterns. And that's a lot easier now with Ravelry. Um, anyone can upload a pattern on Ravelry. There's no vetting. There's no quality check, um, which means that unfortunately you do get some people who are not actually professional designers and whose patterns are not professional patterns, shall we say. Um, and that kind of gives the whole... So I've heard some people say, well, I won't buy a Ravelry because it's all people who don't know what they're doing, which isn't fair because there's some very, very good designers on Ravelry, but there's also knitters who just write up something and publish it. So that is one issue with making it more more approachable and it also means that any knitter who wants to earn a bit of money I think they can design decide they want to be a designer and there is 
Omnia Limited number of knitters and it is a very very crowded marketplace and it's very difficult I think to break through. I think it's probably easier now if you are good at social media. I think younger designers probably find that a bit easier. I don't I must admit I don't think I've ever been brilliant at social media but I'm working on it but um, making money as a self-published designer is not easy either. Um, so, you know, the first thing you decide if you want to design is are you going to go the indie, independent designer way, or do you want to uh, work for magazines? And most people who work for magazines, and I think also most designers who work for young companies these days are actually um, freelance designers. I don't know whether any of the big young companies really employ designers anymore. I think it's all freelance. But my yarn's getting a bit tangled up here, so I'm just going to spin this around a couple of times just to untangle my yarn. I did have one quite unpleasant experience uh, a number of years ago now and this is why having community and being able to chat to other designers is very important. The local designer I told you about, um, I kind of returned the favour by her introducing me to several editors. I kind of returned the favour and introduced her to the first magazine that I was published in which was this independent magazine and um, so she started being published there regularly as well and then after a few years there was one month when she contacted me and she said they haven't paid me for the last few designs I've done for them are they, are they owe you money and I was like I don't know because I was being published in that magazine almost monthly at the time so I checked my records and I realized that yes actually they owed me money for something like two or three designs so I emailed the editor and I was promised payment and I had to nag a bit and I eventually got payment and then I sent in another design because I had several designs that had already been commissioned and I realised that there was a bit of a problem and each time I sent something in I had to really nag to get payment and I spoke to, I wanted to find out if other designers were having the same problem and I noticed that there was a lot of new designers in each issue that I hadn't heard of before and a lot of the regulars were giving up so on Ravelry there was a designer group and I actually posted a post there which was completely anonymous. Um, I didn't name anyone. I just said that a magazine was being very slow to pay and um, what would what do people think about the situation? What would your advice be kind of thing? I think something like that. It's quite a few years ago now. And um, Oh, I immediately started getting private messages from other designers saying is this such and such a magazine I'm having problems they owe me for X number of designs and it very be quickly became apparent that this was a big big problem and eventually the owner of the magazine actually replied to the thread and kind of outed herself um, and it, I realized that I wasn't the only one so I actually decided that I would finish the designs that had been commissioned but only if they paid me immediately. And a couple of times I had to uh, say to her that I would meet her at a show I was going to and I'll come and collect a check from her store. Um, so I did end up getting all the money they owed me. But it was a very unpleasant experience and I decided not to work for them again. They eventually went bust. Then they started up the business again in under a new name and in her husband's name, I think. And then that went bust and then I think they started up again in supposedly a cousin's name before it went bust completely. And the last thing I heard about this lady was that she was, this is also a few years ago, that she was doing some kind of life coaching for people, women who want to start their own business. So, a bit of a word of warning there. Um, and this is the problem, you know, if I'm working for a magazine and they're not paying me for several months, I may have done five or six designs for them before I realised that there's a problem. And that's quite worrying, so that is something to bear in mind if you want to design for magazines. The other thing that um, I wanted to chat about was test knitting versus sample knitting versus tech editing. So I use sample knitters to help me to knit extra sam samples for me. I do a lot of work for magazines and yarn companies and I don't always have time to knit all the samples myself. Um, I also sometimes use sample knitters for my self-published patterns if I have a lot of stuff that I want to get published, <laughs> I want to get ready or to knit extra samples for um, 
new samples of old designs or extra samples for shows and that kind of thing. So I do use sample knitters. I have used test knitters in the past. So sample knitters, are um, they should be paid. And they are normally there to knit a sample for the designer. Now there are some designers who do most of the knitting themselves. There are some designers who do none of the knitting themselves. They only use sample knitters. I This is not somebody I personally know, but a very good friend told me about this. One designer who, I don't know whether she still designs actually, I've not seen her patterns for a while, but she came up with the, she basically did the original sketch and then somebody else knitted the swatcher for her design submission. Because um, you have to submit a, a design idea to a magazine and part of that involves doing sketches, doing um, uh, doing uh, sw swatches and that kind of thing. And she basically did the sketch, I think, and pulled the idea together and then somebody else actually knitted her swatches for her. And then when the design was published, um, it actually, she actually had a pattern writer who wrote the pattern, coordinated the knitting, got a sample knitter knitted, wrote the pattern, graded it, all that kind of stuff. And so the designer basically came up with the original idea and that seemed to be it. That's great, but that's not how most designers operate. Most designers do everything. Most freelance designers will do everything from coming up with idea, knitting the swatch, doing the sketch, pulling it all together, sending it to a magazine or a young company, get it uh, commissioned. Then they'll knit a, write a pattern, knit the sample. Um, they may use a sample knitter, which obviously if you do a lot of work, you have to because knitting takes time and there's only so many hours you can knit every day. So, but you are expected, especially for magazines and things, you're expected to write the pattern as well as knit the sample. And I think as a designer, you probably should be able to do both of those things. I know there are designers, I've heard some designers who work for some of the big yarn companies say that they don't knit the samples and they don't write the patterns. So obviously some of the bigger yarn companies, Rowan, for example, I think they actually write, take care of all the pattern writing and sample knitting in-house. Um, whereas all the young companies I've worked for, I've done all the pattern writing, I've done all the sample knitting, or my sample knitters have done the sample knitting. For my book, I had to write all the patterns. Um, after a pattern has been written, it has to be tech edited. So somebody who has to go through it and check that it's all correct and that there are no grammatical errors, no spelling errors, that all the instructions make sense, there's no mathematical errors. And that somebody can follow that pattern and produce the item that you have made. And that was the other problem I had when I first started out was how do I find a tech editor? And I, the first few patterns I really self-published, I didn't have a tech editor because I didn't know I was supposed to have one. Um, I did have somebody who, I became friends with somebody who would test knit some of my patterns for me um help me try and spot errors but that was all i did because i didn't know that i was supposed to get it tech edited I, I knew the magazines had pattern checkers who check patterns but i didn't know how i would go about finding one of those and then i was uh, asked uh, to commission uh, to do a design for a young company it's the first young company i ever worked with and they commissioned me because i'd used their yarn for a design that was on the cover of a magazine and um they contacted me there was a young companies take more notice i think when the design is on the cover of a magazine and they contacted me and asked if i could do some designs for them and i said yes and then they said we need the pattern and you have to get it tech edited i was like how do i do that so i actually contacted one of the tech editors that i worked with uh, on one of the magazines and said do you do freelance work and she said yes now i think that's since then i've changed tech editor a couple tech editors a couple of times but now i think it's a lot easier to find tech editors because there are groups and ravelry and probably other places um social media you can ask around so i think finding a tech editor now is probably a lot easier than it was when i started out so um but there is a lot of confusion i think among knitters about what's best having a pattern tech edited, tech edited or test knitted. I've heard people say they won't buy a pattern unless it's been test knitted. Now let me just make one thing clear. Tech editing, all patterns should be tech edited. Whether they are a free, whether it's a free pattern or not, it should be tech edited. Um, 
because it's very easy, difficult to proofread and check your own work and it should be check edited by somebody who knows about knitting. So that's the first thing. Test knitting. I think most people have their patterns test knitted. They're actually having what I would call preview knitters or promotional knitters. Somebody knits the pattern and then they share photos on social media and it helps to promote the pattern. In my experience, test knitters are not very good at finding mistakes. Maybe I just, there just weren't any mistakes in those patterns, I don't know. Um, but I don't find that test knitting is that useful in terms of finding mistakes. I do feel like I would benefit from having preview knitters or test knitters or preview knitters knitting my patterns before they're published because it would help to get more publicity, especially if they were good at doing photos and had a big following on social media and all that kind of stuff. But it does require quite a bit of organisation and it means that you have to plan ahead quite a bit. Like I have three cows now that are ready for, well, almost ready for release. I have this one, which is in tech editing. I have another one, which is undergoing tech editing at the moment. Then I have this one, which has been finished for months, but I haven't finished a pattern and sent it off for tech editing. So that's one of my jobs next week. Um, now, if I was going to get this test knitted, or preview knitted, promotional knitted, I should have really organised all that last spring. And I could have done it for this one because I knitted this one last spring. So this one's been done for months. I just haven't gone around to doing anything because I thought it's summer. And it's a lot of extra work to organise test knitters. Some of the really, really big designers like Stephen West, for example, I understand I heard someone recently say that he has a test knit coordinator. Um, I don't earn enough money to pay for a test knit coordinator. But I can quite understand why that would be a good idea. So, But just because something's been test knitted doesn't mean it's going to be more error free than something that hasn't been test knitted. If you're looking for a pattern that's likely to be error free and easy to follow, you need to make sure that it's been uh, tech, knit, tech edited. Uh, test knitted doesn't really have a new, huge amount of value in my opinion when it comes to creating error free patterns but tech editors are worth their weight in gold. Okay so I think I've chatted for quite a bit now so I think I'll leave everything else. I had a couple more things I was thinking about saying but I think I will leave that for now. I haven't done an awful lot of knitting either actually um, mainly because I'm on a pattern row and um, apparently brioche patterning is a bit complicated to knit while I'm trying to talk at the same time. But let me know, um, do you fancy designing? Does that appeal to you? Um, how do you choose patterns? Do you uh, like seeing test knitted patterns appear on social media? Does that encourage you to, to knit the pattern more? The last time I test knitted a pattern I had a really bad experience with somebody and it's kind of put me off a bit. I am considering it but I need to be a bit more organized I think because I tend to finish something and then I'm like right get it tech edited and get it out there because if I don't get around to getting the pattern finished and off to my tech edit as soon as possible quite often it ends up sitting here for months um so that's kind of why I've been a bit a bit reluctant to um get patterns test knitted or preview knitted uh, but I do see the value in it from the point of view of getting publicity for your patterns um, if not to find the spot errors because I don't think it's all that good for that but it is something I'm considering for next year and I hope you enjoyed this video this will be posted at some point in November I think I'm trying to record ahead a little bit because I've got quite a lot of stuff coming up in November so if you'd like to see more knit and chat videos let me know let me know if there are any topics in specific particular that you would like to see I am actually thinking about doing a kind of um idea to design kind of video um i was going to do it the last time i submitted a design to a magazine but i just didn't have time so i'm thinking about next time this specific this one specific magazine i've got in mind next time they send out a call for designs i am thinking that i will film the process and take you through from when i get the call for designs and what my swatching this, uh, sketching putting putting the kind of design submission together to um, the yarn arriving, knitting the sample and then to the final published product. Would that, you be interested in that? Would that be something fun? Um, anyway, if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, please let me know and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.